Welcome again. Today, lecture uh, part two on solubilization theory. My name is Thomas Boving. I'm a, a Fulbright a scholar from the University of Rhode Island, and I am here at the University, the Indian Institute of Technology in Rocky. I start with a brief review from last time. Part one was all about hydrogen bonds and how hydrogen bonds give water exceptional physical and chemical properties like high surface tension, high boiling point, high freezing point, and so on and so on. Extreme, uh, 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 very important properties that make water so uh, unique. However, water is not a good solvent for hydrophobic compounds. Hydrophobic means water disliking, and examples include oil or uh, metals, for example. These uh, compounds do not dissolve in water very well. However, we can add what is called amphiphatic compounds like surfactants to the solution and they facilitate the dissolution of even more hydrophobic compounds in water. In this context, we talked about formation of critical mice uh, of micelles as depicted here above what is called the uh, uh, micelle concentration. Now, today we're going to continue in uh, terms of solubilization, how we can uh, dissolve contaminants or compounds that would otherwise very difficult to be dissolved in water. In this context, we're talking about emulsion, co-solvency effect, and complexation. So emulsions. Emulsion is a mixture of two liquids that normally cannot be combined. Think about oil and water. When you mix oil and water and shake the mixture, you will find that after a little while, the oil separates from the uh, water and floats on the top. Think about uh, Italian salad dressing or mayonnaise. So emulsifying is the process by which two liquids are uh, mixed together and rapidly agitated and that disperses and suspends tiny droplets of either water in, uh, in oil or oil in water. That's what we consider an emulsion. And emulsions are all around us. They're everyday items like cream, mayonnaise, milk, butter, and there are many, many more. So you're all familiar with milk, of course. I hope you have it in your refrigerator and keep it there because if you don't, it turns bad and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But milk is considered an emulsion and it's, in this case, uh, we're talking about um, water being the continuous phase and within the water we have find tiny droplets of milk fats and other proteins and whatever makes up milk. We don't care about the details but bottom line is water is considered the continuous phase into which the milk particles are dispersed into. We call this a direct emulsion or in uh, emulsion term terms O slash W oil in water type of emulsion. This is one type of emulsion. Another type of emulsion can be created by dispersing water in oil. So think about a cream, like a Nivea cream I showed you on the previous slide, or butter. These are uh, examples of the type of emulsions where water is dispersed in tiny droplets in oil. So these are the two main types of emulsions, OW and WO. And by the way, blood is also, also an emulsion. In this case, the, uh, substances, the substance that is uh, emulsified in water are albinoid substances. Okay, this picture uh, explains to you what I said earlier, that there are two types of emulsions. One where we have, in this case, oil, small oil particles, tiny oil particles, uh, dispersed into the main phase, the continuous phase, and that is water. So this would be an OW uh, type of emulsion, and milk is the prime example. The other type I mentioned is where tiny droplets of water dispersed in oil. Oil is the continuous phase. Example, butter, or in science terms, WO type of emulsions. So these type of emulsions are the dominant types. And there are some in-betweens, but uh, we won't go into too much detail here. But bottom line is if we can disperse tiny droplets of either oil in water or water in oil, we can create emulsions. 
So how can we distinguish a emulsion from a solution? We defined a solution as being a homogeneous mix which is clear and uh, transparent. So emulsions are not. Emulsions scatter light and in macro emulsions that is the particles are large enough small enough and large enough at the same time to scatter the incoming light to reflect the incoming light. So what you get is a, a, a liquid that is not transparent that's the emulsion here and is often white like milk right milk is very clean looking white and that's because the light cannot penetrate the milk it gets reflected which gives it a very white appearance. Now if we disperse those droplets to even tinier size in the realm of 100, 10 to 100 nanometers we're talking about micro emulsions. Right? Micro emulsions is what we discussed in the previous slide. Now I'm saying we're dispersing these droplets to make them even smaller and then we talk about micro emulsions and micro emulsions are much more difficult to distinguish from solutions because they appear clear and trans, uh, translucent. They let the light through. Here you need uh, special instruments to determine if you indeed have a solution or if you have a micro emulsion. So bottom line is uh, macro emulsions are clearly distinguishable from solutions because they scatter the light and they appear white mostly and micro emulsions are too small to have this interference with light therefore appear clear and translucent. Macro emulsions, the ones with the larger droplets relatively speaking, are inher inherently instable. That means after a certain time the droplets will coalescent and form larger droplets and larger droplets and eventually you will have phase separation meaning the oil uh, separates from the water. That, was, uh, that makes a micro, a macro emulsion unstable. On the other hand, micro emulsions <coughs> are not. They are very stable over long periods of time. They do not tend to separate and that makes it interesting for many uh, purposes because the last thing you want is a separation of oil and water to revert into something that is neither appealing nor tasty for consumer products like milk or butter and so on and so on. So then let's talk about why milk doesn't separate. I mean at least initially, right? So fresh milk. Fresh milk doesn't separate into layers of oil and water. And that's not gonna, uh, for, even if you have the milk in the refrigerator for two weeks, it's still okay. So the secret of milk is that it has what is called an emulsifier. An emulsifier, casein, that's the name of the emulsifier, is a compound that liaisons between the two liquids, the oil and the water, and uh, makes the emulsion stable, serves to stabilize a mixture. That's what emulsifier does, right? And there are many types of emulsifiers. I mentioned casein. There are different types of emulsifiers in egg yolks. Lysetine, you may have heard about that. It's a fat emulsifier. So Mother Nature gives us uh, plenty of examples for naturally occurring emulsifiers and then, then there's a whole list of chemical products made on an industrial scale that serve the same purpose. Emulsifiers. They prevent the uh, separation of two liquids that otherwise would not mix. So now you may ask, okay, so why is milk separating? And it's a little bit off the topic, but let's spend a minute or two on why milk separates. So in milk, we have bacteria and the bacteria break down the uh, components of the, of the milk. These type of bacteria are called actually lactic acid bacteria. Lactic means milk, right? And they focus on the lactose, which is a sugar, which gives the milk its sweet taste. Now, these bacteria take on the lactose, convert it, and convert it into what is lactic acid. Lactic acid, anybody who has ever smelled lactic acid knows exactly what it smells. It smells like rotten milk. The presence of lactic acid lowers the pH, and the casein, the emulsifier of milk, is breaking down at lower pH. So what happens, the water and oil phase separate, and the milk curdles and that's the last thing you need is curdled milk, right? 
So the milk turns bad when uh, bacterial action uh, destroys the emulsifier. That's basically the reason why milk turns bad over time. Okay, so when you take uh, milk under a microscope, what you see are tiny little droplets I mentioned earlier. We call these colloids. Okay, colloids, these are the, these tiny little droplets that fall into a specific size range. These are uh, uh, compounds, droplets, that are uh, larger than molecules, but smaller than 0 0.01 uh, millimeter. So tiny, tiny droplets, not visible with the eye, but clearly visible under the electron microscope, for example. So colloids are important because colloids have some interesting properties. So we talk about that in a different lecture, but bottom line is emulsions are uh, colloids made up of colloidal materials. So now we know what an emulsion is, let's talk about how we can actually create one. Um, there are different theories out there. The one theory I introduce you to here is based on the presence of surfactants. Remember surfactants, right? Those surface active amphiphatic compounds. So besides forming micelles, surfactants also lower the interfacial tension of a solution containing two different liquids, let's say oil and, uh, oil and water. The interface between oil and water is being occupied by surfactant molecules as being shown here or here, meaning that these surfactants uh, adhere to the surface, to that interface, and at the same time lower the interfacial tension, meaning in water, we said water has a very high uh, surface tension, but in the presence of uh, surfactants, that uh, 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 tension goes way down. And by lowering, by decreasing the interfacial tension between the water and the non-aqueous phase liquid, this is fancy speak for oil, non-aqueous phase liquid, or a short NAPL, is facilitated by those surfactants, to the point that um, oil and water become mixable, forming an in emulsion. So the uh, the reason behind this whole uh, emulsion forming process is the presence of compounds like surfactants that lower the interfacial tension and as a result make it possible that we get tiny droplets of oil in water or water in oil to uh, form an emulsion. So what does that mean if I emulsify, let's say, Let's say we had a gas station with a leaking underground storage tank. You start digging, you find gasoline or diesel or any other petroleum product floating on the groundwater table, very common situation. But if I add uh, um, surfactants and emulsify the oil, mix it with the water, then the oil becomes all of a sudden mobile because now it can be transported with the flowing groundwater advective dispersive transport, which again is a topic of a different lecture, but bottom line is emulsified oil can be transported with the water phase, in this case flowing groundwater. And this can be put to good use through a, a, a technology that relies on enhanced, mobiliz no, sorry, enhanced mobilization, which can effectively remove large quantities of pollutants from the subsurface. Uh, we'll talk about that in our next lecture. So bottom line is uh, mobilization of uh, hydrophobic contaminants like oil is possible by emulsification using surfactants as the emulsifier, lowering the interfacial tension between the aqueous and the non-aqueous phase. Okay, that's one uh, way we can increase the uh, mobility or the solubility, if you wish, of um, hydrophobic compounds. Another way is by co-solvency. Co-solvency refers to a technique of using a co-solvent or co-solvents for enhancing the solubility of otherwise poorly soluble, mostly organic compounds, hydrophobic compounds. Okay, so by adding a co-solvent, we can enhance the solubility of hydrophobic compounds. Pretty straightforward. This is a schematic of how this works. Let's say we have a beaker that has both oil and water mixed together. Let's say green is water and the blue is oil. 
Okay, these two don't mix, we know that. But if we add a co-solvent in some amount, we increase the uh, solubility of that poorly soluble compound, in this case the oil on top. So here's our reddish co-solvent. We mix them together. What we get is a solution that is now completely mixed, meaning there's no two separate phases. It's a homogeneous solution with all the characteristics of a solution. And the way to do this is by adding a co-solvent. So the, the, the working of a co-solvent is different from surfactants uh, in, in, in that it, the, the co-solvent is actually changing the bulk properties of the solution. The surfactants are basic, uh, were molecules we added, they form micelles, so it was more like a molecular uh, additive. But when we uh, mix a co-solvent, we basically change the bulk properties of the solution. We make it more suitable for hydrophobic compounds. In other words, the water with uh, a co-solvent added becomes more like a hydrophobic a solvent like acetone or uh, chloroform or dichloromethane. So the co-solvent makes the water more, like, more likely to dissolve hydrophobic compounds. And this effect is what we call the co-solvency effect. Now, there are many examples for co-solvents. Probably the most used ones are ethanol, ethanol, right, and isopropyl alcohol. These are fairly low molecular weight inexpensive, non-toxic, uh, alcoholic compounds. And when added to water, they will enhance the solubility of hydrophobic compounds. And particularly lower, weight molecule, lower molecular weight hydrocarbons like chlorinated ethanes, which are of very great environmental concern, compounds like trichloroethylene, or tetrachloroethylene, TCE, or PCE. Okay? So, uh, ethanol, isopropyl alcohol. So you can ask, why don't we use methanol? Methanol is even more uh, simple, but methanol is toxic. So we don't want to add a toxic compound to a mix of toxic substances. That doesn't help us, it makes it worse. So one uh, condition we have for co-solvent <coughs> enhanced flushing is those co-solvents should be non-toxic or at least much less toxic than the compounds we're trying to remediate. Now, for higher molecular weight, longer chain hydrocarbons, um, those compounds are better uh, solubilized by higher molecular weight, longer chain co-solvents, meaning alcohols that have additional C atoms, so something like pentanol or butanol, hexanol, and so on and so on. The higher mo uh, molecular uh, co-solvents work better for higher molecular contaminants like gasoline compounds and diesel compounds and what's not. But the bottom line is there's a large list of alcoholic compounds we can choose from and tailor to the conditions at the site that we want to remediate. This graph illustrates how, uh, for example, the uh, solubility of PC, a chlorinated solvent, is enhanced by ethanol and isopropyl alcohol, two types of uh, solvents. We have on the x-axis the co-solvent fractions, means the concentration of co-solvent in solution. And on the y-axis we find the uh, apparent solubility of PCE when exposed to these co-solvent mixtures of increasing concentrations. So pure PCE solubility in water is fairly low. We're talking about 200 milligrams, okay, so we would have uh, solubility of about 200 milligrams per liter of PC in just water, no co-solvents. Now with increasing uh, concentrations, increasing fractions of co-solvent, you can clearly see how the solubility of the PC rises. So in a solution containing 80% either ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, they're pretty close, we have about a solubility, again this is log scale, let's make it 3,500,000. This is uh, <clears throat> three orders of magnitude higher than the aqueous solubility of PC, which is 200. So by adding 
Co-solvents, we significantly increase the solubility of PC in the resulting co-solvent solution. And that, again, opens doors for applications in the field. We talk about that in the next lecture. But bottom line is the co-solvency effect is a very strong one when applied at the right uh, conditions, under the right conditions. The whole process of dissolving contaminants uh, using the co-solvents, uh, co-solvent can be modeled with this fairly straightforward formula here, where the log SM is the uh, solubility of the nonpolar, let's say, PCE chemical in the co-solvent mixture. That's what we want to know. And it's the function of the initial aqueous phase solubility, the log of SW, and the effect of the co-solvent itself. Important, the fraction of the co-solvent, its power, and some empirical coefficient that uh, models the uh, water co-solvent interaction. So if we know these um, uh, factors, we can calculate the resulting solubility enhancement in terms of the solubility of the compound in the co-solvent mixture. Now, the co-solvency power is pretty straightforward. It's basically the log of the uh, enhanced concentration in the uh, co-solvent divided by the compound's aqueous phase concentration. So again, in case of PCE, that would be 200 milligrams per liter aqueous phase <coughs> solubility. And depending on the concentration, let's say 350,000 milligrams per liter. And you can do the math, that's about 1.1500. Excuse me if I got that wrong, I do it out of my head. So bottom line is a very strong um, co-solvency power and that clearly makes it possible for us to predict uh, how much solubility enhancement we can expect by uh, a certain concentration or fraction of co-solvents. So from the previous, it's evident that co-solvency is very potent. It can enhance the solubility by several orders of magnitude. Okay. In general, the co-solvency effect is more pronounced for more hydrophobic compounds. PCE is eh, intermediately hydrophobic, but compounds like PH is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are more complex organic compounds. They have a much lower initial aqueous solubility, but if exposed to co-solvent, their uh, concentration will rise even more than PCE does. So higher molecular weight, more hydrophobic compounds can be more effectively, efficiently co-solubilized than lower molecular weight compounds. Okay, let's move on to the third way how we can increase the solubilization of hydrophobic compounds. And this is by means of complexation. Now, complexation refers to intermolecular interactions between a host molecule and a guest. So in this uh, scheme here, the host molecule is some uh, macromolecule. Here's the guest, that would be our contaminant. And a complex can form when the two combine, when the guest partitions into the interior of the large host molecule. This process we call inclusion complexation, the partitioning of a guest compound into a host molecule. Pretty neat. It's basically a process that works at, on the molecular scale. However, it's different than the micelles, right? Micelles were clusters of um, maybe millions of surfactants moving together. In inclusion complexation, we're talking one host, one guest, one inclusion complex. Now, an example of uh, these macromolecules that are large enough to host a guest is a, sp a specific group of sugars. They're called cyclodextrins. These are torrid-shaped macrocyclic compounds composed of six to eight glucose sugar units. So if you look in at this uh, slide here, you see the glucose units joined together, forming what is basically a circular structure. And the structure has a cavity, and importantly, that cavity is hydrophobic. The outside of the structure is hydrophilic. So the, the hydrophobic contaminant, or guest, can partition into the hydrophobic cavity of the cyclodextrin molecule. 
the hydrophilic exterior of the cyclodextrin molecule ensures that this host complex is water soluble. And that's the trick. We're basically tricking the hydrophobic compound into the very water soluble interior of the cyclodextrin molecule. That's called in, uh, complexation and it's the means by how we can increase the solubility of hydrophobic compounds using cyclodextrins. So maybe this slide to make it even more visible. Here's our cyclodextrin host molecule, our contaminant molecule, and here is the inclusion complex, which is very soluble with the hydrophobic compound uh, complexed within the center of the cyclodextrin molecule. So this can be uh, used to enhance the solubilization of hydrophobic compounds. So if we add cyclodextrin to water and inject that water into uh, soil or aquifer that's contaminated, then the contaminants, the hydrophobic contaminants, partition into the ca cavity of the cyclodextrin molecule. Here's another visual of what is a cyclodextrin molecule. So the hydrophobic contaminants partition into the center, the hydrophobic exterior ensures that the uh, complex uh, compound is now dissolved. In this slide, I uh, show you how the cyclodextrin concentration is linearly related to the concentration of the contaminant. So on the x-axis, again, the concentration, the cyclodextrin concentration from 0 to 50% by weight. And on the y-axis, you see the relative contaminant concentration. Um, in this case, it is uh, trichloroethylene, another chlorinated solvent. So if I, let's say, uh, have a 30% cyclodextrin solution, I will see an increase of about 14 times over TCE's aqueous solubility. 15 times greater solubility means we can speed up our remediation process 15 times faster, ideally. So as long as we know the relationship between the cyclodextrin concentration and the solubility enhancement, we can predict uh, how much of this compound or how quickly it can be removed. So let me summarize then the key points of part two of today's lecture. We talked about emulsions. We talked about how emulsions can mobilize organic compounds by reducing the surface tension or interfacial tension, I should say. Um, emuls emuls emulsifying compounds like surfactants are available at industrial scale. It's very easy to pick uh, and choose the most appropriate surfactant to get the best emulsification, which is uh, contaminant specific. That's one way to increase solubility. Another way is by adding co-solvents into the solution. Co-solvents like ethanol, isopropyl alcohol modify the solution's properties to make it more similar to the properties of the hydrophobic compound that we intend to dissolve. Very straightforward indeed. It can be uh, done at any scale because isopropyl ethanol, for example, these alcohols are fairly inexpensive and non-toxic. And third, we discussed what happens if we complex a hydrophobic compound in the interior of a host molecule, a supramolecule, large molecule like cyclodextrin, which has a cavity that's hydrophobic, but its exterior is hydrophilic, meaning we trick the contaminant to, to partition into the cavity. And by the host molecule being very water soluble, we can move the contaminant from the soil, from the aquifer, flush it out and move it away, clean up the aquifer in the process. And this is exactly the topic or the uh, technologies we're going to discuss in the following lecture, which focuses on enhanced solubilization and mobilization. This, is, this lecture will inform us how we can translate the theory, the solution theory we talked about the last two lectures, and put that to good use in remediation engineering with the goal of cleaning up a polluted aquifer. With that, I'd like to thank you again for your attention and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.